So, uh, as Joe said, I was I had the uh, huge fortune while I was in the Air Force to come here to do uh, graduate research on the effect of government funding on new technology venture creation and growth, um, which at the time when I started, I had no idea what that meant. And I took this class by this uh, a great professor named Ernestine, who taught me how to spell venture capital. And I had come here, you know, coming from the department, coming from the Air Force, and going, how do big organizations innovate? That was gonna be my thesis. And I took one class with Ernestine, and I said, I'm not doing that anymore. So that's the side, I'm gonna work with startups, and work with founders, I'm gonna work with the bleeding edge of innovation, because I think that's where, you know, for me personally, the most interest was, and, and uh, it certainly changed my entire career, um, and it kind of led us to uh, uh, give us the opportunity to stand up this office, um, which has really been a big push by the department. So I've got a couple slides. I'll walk through a bit about who we are, what we do, what our focus is, um, but then very keenly interested in your questions. I think Ernestine's gonna come up and we'll have a, a chat after this. Um, so the Office of Strategic Capital, is, as, as Joe mentioned, uh, it exists to attract and scale private capital in support of national security. Why? Because as Joe also mentioned, we are in a global competition for emerging and critical technologies. Um, when we say critical technologies, uh, the US government has, has a really kind of diverse set of technology areas that they think are critical. Critical uh, for national and economic security. Uh, these represent key industries. In the Department of Defense, we have 14 critical technology areas. Some of them are very much kind of military focused, hypersonics, directed energy, but many of them are what I consider pervasive enabling industries. Semiconductors is a great example of this. Every government department in the United States, we've got a varied set of departments and agencies that focus on some aspect of technology, has semiconductors as a critical enabling technology. Uh, renewable energy, biotech, quantum, advanced materials. These are all critical industries for the future of US competitive advantage. Now in fueling these industries and in fueling the continued innovation, growth, scale up manufacturing production of the technologies and products that are derived from those technologies, it is private capital that is the dominant source of financing. So a US policy generally, and this has kind of been this way since, since World War II, uh, the US government policy is we're going to fund the advancement of basic research through prototyping action. We had a $184 billion budget last year that focused on this aspect of technology creation and the initial stage, stages of what we would call productization, which basically takes something from a, a concept to a prototype. But it's the private capital markets that are responsible for driving the commercialization or going from prototype to product, and then from product to scale, right? To pay for infrastructure production and manufacturing. Now, in this competitive framework, if we know that private capital is the dominant resource of financing these critical technologies, that's a great US competitive advantage. Why? Because over half of the world's private capital is in the United States. Right? We have the largest and most liquid capital markets. We have the most sophisticated financial tools, and they work at very different areas of the industrial base, in the supply chain, and they work to motivate returns. Right? Capital's gonna flow to returns. Again, that's why the US has the largest and the most liquid capital markets. The problem that we see today is that the critical technology areas are not receiving a, what we could saw, consider a sufficient amount of financing to advance US national economic security interests. Right? So this is just a for example. For example, e-commerce uh, received uh, nearly two and a half times as much investment as AI uh, over the last few years. Uh, even if, if AI's growth through LLMs, right, e-commerce is still a dominant source of financing. But it's a 150 times more investment than in things like quantum. So if you're working on a PhD in quantum and you're like, hey, I've got this great idea, I wanna go commercialize it, it's really hard to go find sources of capital that are willing to fund your company. Again, why is this? Is because software industries or software enable industries can return capital faster. They're lowest, lower technical risk, right? Investors don't invest in technology risk, they invest in business model risk, they understand that the technology risk is driven down, so it really is a, a, an attempt to understand product market fit. And this is a trend that may be kind of clear to us today, but has really kind of shifted drastically over the last few, uh, few decades, right? So even as close as 2006, seven time, time frame, when I was doing my undergrad, you know, 45% of all venture investment was in hardware. You know, back in 2017, closer to 8%, 8 the last number I saw was closer to 3%, right? We've seen a massive decline of early stage commercial investment in hardware, 
risk-based enabled industries. There's a lots of very good reasons for this from a capital market perspective, right? Hardware industries are more expensive. They're more capital intensive industries that take longer to generate a return. And they're normally in fields that are less well understood and can be less well priced by investors, right? If I'm investing in FinTech companies, I could do eight deals at $5 million a pop and I kind of know what the return profiles look like. And I know what my you know, net margins are gonna look like because there's comparables out there. If I'm doing work in meta materials, Right? There's like one IPO in the last three years at $260 million uh, uh, valuation. Right? It is not a looked at as a returnable uh, venture style investment. And so what we see is all of the, all these, these technologies that we, the Department of Defense, who represents over the half of the country's R&D budget, or our colleagues at the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy are financing, are building these great prototypes. And there's just not access to capital to advance those technologies from where they are in their development from prototype into a commercial product, right? There isn't a market, an investment market or a capital market for those types of those industries that we think are critical to national economic security. And so the national security strategy has taken a hard look at how do we increase capital investments in these areas. So, you know, in the national security strategy, it says we must complement the innovative power of the private sector with a modern industrial strategy that makes strategic public investments in America's workforce in strategic sectors and supply chains, especially critical and emerging technologies, such as microelectronics, advanced computing, bio biotechnologies, uh, clean energy technologies, and advanced telecommunications. And you've seen this over the last few years in things like the CHIPS Act, right, which provided a significant amount of financing into semiconductors. Why? It's because we're trying to crowd in, this concept of crowding in, attracting private capital into areas that it otherwise is not attracted to investing in. Jake Sullivan kind of reiterates this, that you know, today, from a national security perspective, we're investing in industries of the future, strengthening the resilience and security of the supply chains that underpin them. With each of these investments, our goal is to crowd in private capital, not replace it, and attract patient capital to bring these critical technologies to, to scale. You'll hear us talk about this concept of patient capital. What is patient capital? Patient capital is capital that is OK with taking longer timelines to return. That's all it is. Right? So it's saying, hey, instead of doing a traditional you know, five to seven or seven to 10 year fund, you know, it may take a space fund, you know, a space company 14 years to generate profitability. Qualcomm is a great example of this. Right? Qualcomm defined an entire, um, an, an entire technology area uh, funded by programs like the Small Business Innovative Research, this BIR program, went on for massive success, uh, but took a long time to generate return and profitability to its earlier investors. And so, I'm going to go back in time a little bit, and there's a lot of young faces here, so I'll pose a question. Uh, who knows what this is? And I'll give you a hint. It's on the slide. So it's the Cray-1 supercomputer. This is the world's first supercomputer. Cray Research, founded in the early 1970s, um, was struggling, with, like a lot of deep tech companies, to raise capital to produce the world's first supercomputer. Um, 1970s, uh, we were heading into a recession. Uh, Investors are starting to move away from investing in deep tech companies. You know, this is this is just past the era of Intel uh, investment and and, uh, and and semiconductor companies. Really, the industry really being birthed, and now capital is starting to dry up. And it's drying up mostly in the areas of the economy that are the most expensive to invest in, like building a brand new product for a market that does not exist. Now, fortunately for Cray, there was this program at the time called the Small Business Investment Company Program (SBIC) program. Show of hands, who knows what SBIR is? Okay, who knows what SBIC is? So SBICs are the much older sibling of SBIR. 1957, Sputnik crosses our skies. Eisenhower administration goes, geez, we gotta do something about this technology race. So Eisenhower administration does three massive things. They create this organization called DARPA, they create NASA, and they create the Small Business Investment Company Program, SBIC program. The SBIC program provides government-backed loans to equity investors to make investments in areas of national security concern. The SBIC program helps to massively accelerate this brand new asset class called venture capital. At one point in the mid-1960s, two-thirds of all venture capitalists are backed by the US government through the SBIC program. It funds companies like, like Intel, like Sun, like Apple Computing, like Cray the Cray Supercomputer. Um, and now this program, uh, provided a lot of very necessary capital, especially when markets are heading 
to reduce spending in capital intensive industries because for receipt of this low cost of financing, government backed loans, the equity investors have to make investments in areas that the country thinks are important. So John F. Carlson, who's the CFO of Cray Research, talks about how critical this program was for Cray. The role of SBIC program in securing continuation capital for Cray Research in 1975 cannot be overemphasized. Some may claim that if the SBIC had not been there, Cray would have found another way. Our venture capitalists tell us otherwise. Cray was a company with no product, slipping schedules, and no serious prospects, facing a market generally thought to be no bigger than 80 prospects worldwide and competing with well-funded and established competing programs. Furthermore, the capital market was sluggish, and into this environment, the taxpayers invested, or what I'll go back to, less than $500,000 and became the stimulus for investment of $2.3 million, enough to save Cray Research. So through the SBIC program, the taxpayers provided loans to investors that crowded in additional private capital that saved Cray. But there's this word invested that I want to highlight, because if you worked in the DOD, you know we use this term invested all of the time. We have investment dollars, right? DOD doesn't invest any money. We spend money, right? We have $184 billion to spend. We don't get any of that back, all right? The SBIC program is government-backed loans. There is no money spent through this program. It is lent. Of note, the SBIC program still exists. It's been around since 1958. And in the last uh, nearly 30 years, there's been no taxpayer dollars, no appropriated dollars that have gone to the program, and it's mobilized billions of dollars of capital. Now, it's moved away from investing in critical technology areas, but I'll circle back to that in a little bit. So having gone to uh, uh, Stanford and, and I have tons of business school people in our, in our, in our office, I have to start uh, or kind of go into a two by two. So at uh, uh, OSC, we operate on a framework we call the Critical Technologies Framework. And we think about this in terms of uh, uh, two primary dimensions. If we're thinking about technology competition, it's about advancing technologies into industries, industries being where a technology company can produce a product, make a return, uh, sell the product to a, a market, and generate profitability, right? So we wanna see this kind of virtuous cycle of growth happening in these key enabling industries. Typically, in, the, in, 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 a, in an R&D, government R&D hat, you're thinking about advancing technology and maybe manufacturing across this thing called the, a TRL, technology readiness level. Who knows what a TRL is? Great, technology readiness levels, basically it's just a measure of, it's going from basic research, a white paper, into a, a, a fully fledged product, let's say, that's, that's open and available to the market. So typically we think across this X axis, going from early stage technologies to later stage technologies. We've matured technologies over this thing, you're called the valley of death, right? Uh, but in the, uh, at OSC, we also think about the supply chain. And we think about this because the DOD primarily funds things called capabilities, right? So the Department of Defense is going to fund things for the Air Force, the Space Force, the Navy, the Army. Those are all important to the Department of Defense. But where it doesn't fund directly after this S&T side of the house, again, after this $184 billion of financing, is things in our supply chain. We call these component technologies. Again, this circles back to semiconductors and things like biofuels and advanced materials. And so we today, uh, and have done over the last few years, um, have done a significant survey of government programs that focus on DOD or national security critical technology areas. And our, 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 our position on this is that we don't have formal programs that focus on these technology areas that are inherently within our industrial base today with some notable exceptions like the Chips and Science Act, right? Like the work that the DOE loan program office is doing. And so we've identified that these are strategic capital needs and the commercialization stages of these technology areas and the growth stages of these technology areas, right? So I know at Stanford, we think a lot about venture capital, but at OSC, we're thinking about the entire capital continuum, all the way from commercialization through manufacturing and infrastructure. How do we, how do we increase the capacity and production quality and quantity within these industries and do it in a way that supports national and economic security? So our first program, that we launched was the Small Business Investment Company's Critical Technologies Initiative, which is a program that's available today for application. Through this program, we have uh, worked closely with our colleagues in the Small Business Administration, which own the SBIC program, and created a program uh, initiative around critical technology areas. So investors today are applying to be part of the SBIC program. And the way it works 
If you're unfamiliar with who, under, show hands, who knows what this concept of leverage is? Leveraged finance. Awesome, okay, Mo, most of you do, which is, which is, which is great. Um, leveraged finance is the application of debt to equity to shift the return profiles, right? You're leveraging the returns. It's commonly used in private equity. It was used in venture, not so much today. But where, how this works is the US government provides government-backed loans that partner with private capital. So investors have to bring their own money to the table, which can be matched through this program with government-backed loans. What this does is it creates an investment fund, a licensed limited partnership that then has the mandate to invest in critical technology companies. It's a very simple process, but effectively what it does is allows you to take $1 private capital and allocate $2 to $3 into the ecosystem, into companies themselves, into, as equity investment. Now, all the returns and profitability uh, above repaying the government-backed loan goes back to the general partner and the limited partnership, right? Why is this such a useful tool, and why did we use it during, some would say, the late last great power competition? We use it because it allows us to scalably attract and scale private capital. Scalably attract and scale private capital because it does it in a way that it doesn't cost the taxpayer any money, right? The intent of these programs are to be to low to no costs, right? As we talked about, the SBA program, again, been running since 1958, over the last few decades has not cost taxpayers any money. It's a very different program uh, than typical defense-based programs which are very much focused on contracts and grants, allocating money to advanced technologies. This is the next stage. How do we reduce government spending and do it in a way where we can increase private capital allocation into the areas that we think are most important to national security, but do it in a way where they are generating enough of a return to repay the debt. That's the whole general, generalized concept of OSC, is how do we work with investors, work with companies to increase private capital investment in those areas that we think are most important to national security. As I said, applications are open right now, so you know, tell your favorite VC or private equity fund to go and apply uh, for the program. Um, and, uh, and very excited to um, uh, take your questions. Thank you, for your, thank you for your time. So Jason, thanks for providing that context. Definitely have a number of questions on OSC and the incredible work. You've definitely been busy this past year. Um, but maybe we can um, start off with just some context in terms of you went to MIT, joined the Air Force, um, Stanford PhD, and then launched um, Ventures, part of AFWorks. What inspired you to leave that role, and why did you feel the need to launch OSC? Um, well, you know, like like I said in the beginning, your um, <coughs> your class really inspired me to think differently about and to learn how to spell and learn how to spell, <laughs> which as an MIT grad, I still don't really know how to spell. <laughs> um, but uh, the the venture capital, um, I think, ecosystem was in inspiring in many ways of saying, you know, you know, having come from the Air Force, uh, having you know, been in uh, a part of uh, the last, um, uh, the global war on terror and understanding uh, what the department was doing at, at that time and really trying to understand how do we drive you know, the best tech into our, our, our Air Force um, gave us really a new vertical uh, that we've been growing inside of the department, right? How do we bring in you know, young companies, entrepreneurs, startups who want to work with the Department of Defense. And our goal, when we built AFWorks and we built AFVentures, which was like the SBIR funding arm of, of, of AFWorks, was, you know, I want every, every Series A company, every seed company to take a look at, 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 um, at the Air Force as a potential market. Hey, you know, maybe, maybe it's a good fit for us. Maybe you should come check us out, right? And, and we'll do a small grant. We'll see if there's a there there. We'll do a technical feasibility study, and if there is, We'll continue to increase investment until we get to the point where we decide, hey, this is a, this is a, a match and let's move this from a prototype into a capability. Um, but then, uh, I, and that program was growing and growing and growing and then COVID hit. And uh, we um, uh, um, were asked to come back. I remember I, I, I just had a, um, our, first, uh, our first kids, I think we were, they were, they were uh, maybe eight, eight, nine days old, and it was like, hey, we gotta come back and move to DC and, and help stand up this COVID task force um, thing. And that's where I met uh, J.R. Gibbons, who uh, uh, is our chief investment officer uh, in the back. And, and uh, we worked on this concept of understanding, um, well, not only what are the capabilities, right? What are the things, the products that we need as, as a country um, in support of the mission, but also uh, 
where do we have failure points? Because I don't know if you guys were following COVID, but there was a lot of supply chain issues, right? And we were just, I'm not really tracking what the, the depth of what those issues are or how those were going to affect our ability to acquire things like PPE or other things that the military needed. Um, and so we started working on some of these core concepts. Hey, how do we get ahead of where we see these supply chain issues for new and emerging industries, right? And the DOD is very much focused on its capabilities and its, those supply chains. But when we're looking at new industries, when we're looking at growth in specific areas, how do we ensure that we have access to what we need when we need it? And we saw this as this monumental problem, right? This is a, is the, the end on this has grown, it grows exponentially. Because you're not just focusing on one capability, you're now focusing on supply chain, the growth of the different industries that comprise one military capabilities is enormous. Mm -hmm. And so we got to think, okay, well, we can't just, you know, put more money on the problem. <laughs> we can't go ask Congress for more money to do this, right? Um, even, even with COVID-focused work, we have to figure out other more scalable ways to do it. And then we started looking at our history, right? Where, how did we, were there are times in our history where we've done this or other agencies doing this? And, you know, DOE has had a loan program for a long time. We got to work with them. And then we stumbled across this, this great partnership that we have with the SBA. And at the time, this was back in 2020, um, uh, a, a, a gentleman there has been working there for since the early, you know, the early 1990s. Um, was like, oh, yeah, we can totally do this. It'll take 18 months to do this. And we were like, we don't do things in 18 months. We're AFWorks. We do things in like 30 days, right? <laughs> Let's, this is COVID's now. We got to figure this problem now. And it ended up taking us like three years to get off the ground. So he was wrong in the other direction. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we saw a massive opportunity. And I think mm -hmm. one thing that this team has continued to do is is try to, you know, where do, where do we see gaps that we're just not, totally not addressing today? Mm -hmm. And how do we work um, to advance these opportunities in a way that um, allows us to get after the problems in a more unique way? And we're very fortunate to have the team that we have because it's, 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 it's really a lot of the same core team that was kind of early days in DIU, early days standing up AFWorks, and now, mm -hmm. now early days standing this up. Yeah, yeah. So just on that note of some of these government innovation programs that you just mentioned, um, DIU, InQtel, DARPA, um, how, how does OSC work with these existing programs and how do you also really differentiate and set yourself apart? Yeah, so, so you know, um, we differentiate ourselves really in kind of three key ways. One, for we focus on components, not capabilities, right? We're, we're, we're really focusing on these primarily commercial, non-federal industries, right? Semiconductors. Bio, nobody's going to say semiconductors are, are defense industrial base, right? You know, they're, they're a technology area uh, with a diverse uh, and um, somewhat uh, hard to navigate at times uh, supply base uh, where the vast majority of the revenue uh, for these companies is coming from the commercial sector. Um, uh, so we focus on components, not, not mm -hmm. capabilities. Um, we focus on uh, lending, not spending, right? We, we're, we have some spending type pro focus programs for integration work, but a lot of our focus is, is on uh, lending, and, and which is a very scalable tool that many other government departments have used. We've been lending as a country far longer than we've had a Department of Defense, right? Um, it's a very scalable tool uh, used very effectively over the last uh, 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 many decades. Um, and then uh, we focus on uh, finance primarily, not innovation. So we support the innovation mm -hmm. ecosystem, um, certainly, and there's a lot of opportunities that we can help accelerate some of the core enabling industries for the innovation ecosystem. But we primarily are focused on finance, right? How do we work to make industries uh, uh, um, investable? How do we work with capital markets to increase capital access for these types of companies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, then, um, and then we work with, we work with these other organizations um, very closely to see you know, where DARPA, what's the best, greatest coming out of DARPA? Where, where, where are those companies feeling to access capital? Is there mm -hmm. focus that we can put on that area? Um, working with organizations like DRU or AFWorks to understand, okay, what's the next generation of capabilities that's coming from the commercial mm -hmm. sector that has good promise that we can support with advanced materials or next generation semis or things like quantum sensing. Mm -hmm. uh, but try to find areas of today's capabilities, tomorrow capabilities, and work in our industry to support mm -hmm. those. And uh, for these technologies that you're focused on, these critical technologies, how do you decide on which ones to, to focus on and how do you feel like these priorities will shift over the coming years? Um, you know, it, it, it's a really good question. I would say, you know, the, every, there's a diverse set of government departments, right? So for those of you who aren't aware, of, uh, there's like a Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, the Small Business Administration, National Science Foundation. They all have kind of their critical technologies list, right? And it's kind of like ours, to be honest. There's a lot of, lot of overlap. Um, but the unique thing that we do to focus is we say, okay, well, in those technology areas, um, 
we primarily focus at macro capital flows. What is the capital, what is the amount of capital being invested? What's the capital intensity, right? How long does, what's the mean time to exit as a company mm -hmm. in these areas? Which really helps determine our priority list. So our priority list is not necessarily like the priority list for the country in terms of national security, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's some things that are gonna be on our list or not on our list um, uh, because of the opportunity space for where we see our programs to be mm -hmm. effective, which is primarily of where do we see this partnership opportunity? Where can the private markets be incentivized to move? Right? Where can we attract and scale? Where can it be additive to the market to increase capital availability? Some areas we're gonna offer up, so in, in, hopefully uh, in a few, um, a few months we'll be able to release our first investment strategy, which will identify what our industries uh, mm -hmm. are. Um, and through that list, those will be a first take to the market. And then mm -hmm. the market will respond, hey, we like these, we can't do these. That'll tell us something else about how do we continue to evolve our analysis over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And um, so why do you think the DOD should be centered around providing this sort of loan program versus just becoming a better buyer of technology? An, another great question. So we don't buy, we don't buy semiconductors, right? We don't buy critical components. Mm -hmm. We don't buy uh, the, the supply base for these technologies. We buy the capabilities. Mm -hmm. And then the providers, defense tech startups to defense industrial based providers to companies that are working across the Department of Defense are on contract to provide a thing, but sometimes we have to you know, ground the F-35s because the magnets came from China, right? Like those are things that happen, not because of any kind of negligence, direct negligence in my opinion, it's because the macro economy has shifted production and manufacturing, has shifted a lot of these technologies away from the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's where you know, our focus has been to say, okay, how do we get ahead of, of these industries in such a way where we don't need to have another mm -hmm. CHIPS Act, right? How do we continue to ensure that these industries are cared for and nurtured in a way that allow us to ensure that we have secure access to these components mm -hmm. when we need them? Mm -hmm. um, just given today's global economy, how, how do you envision OSC working with international allies and investors in other countries? Um, you know, the, the, uh, it is extremely important that we continue to work with allies and partners, many of which have like these incredibly uh, useful tools that we don't have today in the Department of Defense or in the US really. And um, there's like, for example, out of the UK, there's the NSIF, the National Security Innovation Fund, right, which provides, is a limited partner to a lot of funds in the UK that focuses on national security, mm -hmm. right? They have very different policies around things like lending or equity investment than we do in the United States. Uh, and then the other big part of this is, um, and I've seen, just my personal time, uh, I've seen over the last really kind of 15 years, a, a direct realization in a lot of our supporting strategic documents to say, you know, critical, this is gonna be a very, maybe a, a simple statement, but critical technologies are developed everywhere, right? Like mm -hmm. the best and, and brightest and the latest breakthroughs can be pervasive around the world, right? How do we advance those industries no matter where they're coming from mm -hmm. in a way that supports our, our national security and economic security interests? Mm -hmm. And so working with allies and partners, working on comparative advantage and working on opportunities mm -hmm. for finance um, to increase investment in these areas is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And is this just for venture capital providers or? Full, full capital stack, right? Mm -hmm. And so you'll, you'll see this. I mean, the first funds coming through the SBIC CT initiative, some of them are early uh, growth stage type investors, traditional VC, some of them are uh, uh, private equity, you know, lower, middle, upper, mm -hmm. uh, middle market uh, uh, type investors. Um, because the um, industrial base is diverse. Not every company needs the same type of capital. Mm -hmm. and they're all different types of growth, and so we're not trying to form fit the function, but I will just uh, say very clearly, you know, our partnership with the SBA is a great learning experience for the Department of Defense. There's 131 federal credit programs in the FY24 budget bill. Um, the uh, DOD is one of three government departments today that does not execute a loan program, right? There's the uh, uh, us, the Department of Labor and Department of, uh, of Justice. And so this is a brand new thing for us. Um, we've done um, some work with other agencies. We've done some things out through the Defense Production Act, mm -hmm. uh, which is a presidential authority. Um, but this is really a first of its kind type of program. And we're really excited about the opportunity to enter the space. And so we're starting with SBA and the SBIC program, and we're gonna to continue to evolve our thinking about how these tools can best be applied. Mm -hmm. Really, really incredible work that you've been working on these last several months. So what are the goals for say like this next year for, for you and OSC? Um, the, I think the biggest uh, goals uh, for us are to run this experiment, right? And that's mm -hmm. what this is. And this is, a, this is a, it's an experiment in how do we get after these kind of endemic uh, issues we see in the capital markets uh, and how do we do it in a way that returns the money to the taxpayer at the end of the day. 
Um, the whole goal is to create a scalable process to attract and scale private capital. And mm -hmm. so that's what we're really doing this first, this first go around. Um, I think the other big thing for us is the first release of our investment strategy to see where the market is, mm -hmm. right? Was the market, can the market participate? Can we attract capital in these areas? And what are the terms mm -hmm. by which we can attract that capital and how do those diversify um, to support more companies and industries moving forward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so Jason, final questions. Um, would love for you to just provide advice for founders, students, investors in the room. Like you've obviously done so much in your career uh, to date so far. Um, what do you recommend for folks in the room who are interested in working at the intersection of technology innovation and national security? Um, I get my biggest uh, request is, you know, can continue to push forward, right? You know, the biggest thing uh, that we have ahead of us as uh, as a country in this in this space is advancing of, of these industries, ad advancing the great research that is happening in universities like Stanford, and doing it in such a way where we can build industries, build the future Qualcomms of the world, build um, uh, the the next generation uh, Intel's or Suns or Cray Research, and do it in a way that is going to create new industries and new growth for the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also put a plug in for government service, right? I know that a lot of folks, especially early on, are looking at potential government service jobs post-graduation, maybe spending a couple year in service. It doesn't have to be with the Department of Defense. Um, but in this space, technology, innovation, national security is pervasive across the U.S. government. National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, right? National security is, a, is, is everybody's on the national security team. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important uh, that we have a diverse set of views and opinions in this in, in in the government working on these problems and i will say you know we have and i continue to uh, uh, look at stanford graduates as hires to osc we're opening new positions next year so if you're interested in working with us please follow us we're going to post positions soon um, but uh, but really keep at it and thank you all for uh, for coming here and and, uh, and being part of this today jason thanks again for joining us here today thank you Um, would like uh, Steve Lang to come up and um, share share your thoughts on on all this and also just the entire quarter as well. So uh, I hope you appreciate how extraordinary this conversation has been. So Jason, when you joined AFWorks in 2019, there were what a hundred or so incubators and accelerators in the DoD, all giving out what I'd call door prizes in SBIR, right, a million and a half dollars, and you were the only one who had an insight that said. Maybe we could use the existing legislation to actually do stack zibbers and called stratcoms and tatcoms, et cetera, to give out $10, $15 million or more, right? You didn't create new legislation. You just used the ones that existed. With OSC, you've taken this at a, another level completely to figure out how to tap into hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars of other people's money as a force multiplier to even more other people's money. I want you to all understand that this is a single individual inside of a three million person organization where everybody says no, right? <laughs> and not only no, no, it can't be done. So one is you're looking at somebody extraordinary and so are you. Everybody here in this room are capable of this. But think about what it takes to do this. It takes somebody to say the status quo is not good enough. And it says, how do we do this within the system we have rather than just complaining about it? And it takes a great team in the back of the room to actually build a team to go do this as well. I think that's kind of a sum of the people you saw this quarter. Extraordinary people just like you who said the status quo was designed by other human beings. That the walls that everybody puts up, if you haven't seen the Steve Jobs talk on this, you should go look at it. We're designed by other human beings, and we can move those walls, and we could decide to create other processes and procedures that actually make us better. And I want you all to think about that, how can you be the next Jason Rapke? How can you be the new Sue Gordon? How can you make the country better, whether it's in the Department of Defense, or in the Department of Energy, or some other mission-oriented organization, where it's not, let's just do more of the same. So uh, that's my wrap up, and, and Jason, thank you for your service and your group service, and uh, we're all standing by for the checks as we walk out. Can, <laughs> I, can I just can I uh, can I just stress can I stress one thing? I um 
I would say uh, when when we did when we built AffWorks uh, and built that program, it, it it definitely takes it takes a tight team, not a big team, but a tight team. And you know when we built that program, I was at Stanford. We had a a, a person in D.C. and a person in in, um, in the Netherlands. All Air Force captains, um, and 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 the OSC team is exactly the same way. It's it is you got to find you got to find your you got to find your people. Um, and I will tell you, you know, you could definitely, I'm sure you could do it as an individual. I, I failed miserably trying to do this as an individual in, in previous jobs, plenty of failures. Um, but it, the, team, the team is what really moves the needle. Well, thank you again. And, and thank all of you for coming up uh, this semester. Tell your friends that uh, we're going to do this again next year. Uh, and hopefully we could get Jason and, uh, and team back again. And uh, you should all again go home thinking about, you know, how can you do this? And, in, in your gap year between your commercial career and your uh, service career. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.